Our Father, we thank Thee for this day and for Thy love and mercy. And as we launch into this pastor's college, we realize we're leaving the shore. Now we're on a journey. And we want to reach the appropriate destination, the one of Thy choosing. And I pray that all things will work together and we shall see the total picture of what we should see. Help us now. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've done this many times, that is, conduct a pastor's college. I remember the first time I dared to do this, I had to get to the place in my life where I could get over the idea that I don't need to be telling anyone what to do. And the truth is, I'm just trying to share things from my heart with your heart that the Lord has used in my life. An exchange of ideas, if you, if you would. And so I, I want to place these things before you and I'm praying that God will use them in a very special way in your life. When uh, planning this particular pastor's college, I, I thought I will call this the Signature Pastor's College. And if you were talking about the ministry that God has given me or God has given us, us in this uh, church or in our college, these are the signature things, the things that, that are, I trust things that people remember, this is the way we do it. This is the way God has led us. And I want you to write a few things down so that you keep quotes. I don't speak to be heard. <clears throat> I speak to be repeated. And I think that's what all of you should do. You should not speak just to be heard if you think, I'm going to speak to be heard. No, you want to speak to be repeated. And the exponential growth of that, the Moving forward to that, getting down the line with what you said, one person telling another person works wonderfully well in the principle we talk about of being able to teach others also. If you have this notebook open to volume one, the Signature Pastor College, I, I want you to know that we're on a venture to try to make a difference in the world, <clears throat> to truly make a change, <clears throat> to change the world. God helping us. But the change that we'll be able to make in the world is directly related to the change we allow the Lord to make in our lives. The difference that we make with our lives is in direct proportion to the difference we allow God to make in our lives. So if you're trying to say, I, I want to make a difference, great. Then what difference has God made in your life? We need not expect to be used of God to make a difference in the world if we're not yielded to the Lord to allow the Lord to make a difference in our lives. Now, this is vital to, to all that we're doing and may, may God guide us in this in every way. I've written a letter, that just a short one. I want you to read it with me as you follow along uh, to help you gain understanding to gain an understanding of what we're, what we're about. Welcome to the Signature Pastors College. And I make this statement, our mutual love for the Lord Jesus Christ brings us together. I'd like to underline that expression. Our mutual love for the Lord Jesus Christ brings us together. What do we have in common? What we have in common is Christ and our love for Christ. I am a Christian. I was led to Christ by a personal soul winner. I like to state it that way because I believe in soul winning and personal soul winning. I believe it's what God has given us to do and because I believe that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man and that we never, we never offer the gospel to the wrong person, that we ought to be trying to get the gospel to all people. And I give this expression, biblical Christianity has become a way of life for me. The scripture being the sole authority for our faith and practice, biblical Christianity. And I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. I am a member of an independent Baptist church and we identify with a family of Baptist friends worldwide. Now there are many people who are not Baptists who befriend us and we befriend them. But I am a Baptist by conviction and I know why I am a Baptist. I think the thing that we have that is so desperately needed is the emphasis we place on individual soul liberty and the priesthood of every believer. And so... We'll talk more about that also. 
And so I want you to remember this expression, biblical Christianity, and remember this expression, Baptist friends. Then we're committed to the global gospel initiative given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. This may be just another way of saying the Great Commission, but the truth of the matter is it ought to be an initiative. It'll be something we do, this global gospel initiative. Now, I'm going to be very frank with you. I'm going to try to get you engaged in this global gospel initiative, and I'm going to try to get you to be able to define what you mean by biblical Christianity, and I'm going to try to help you to be able to express to others and articulate, well, what you mean by saying, I am a Baptist, and by a Baptist by conviction. I've written a little statement at the bottom, and this is so important to me. I trust important to you. Our faith is a treasured heritage, not a contemporary heritage experiment. Our faith is a treasured heritage, not a contemporary experiment. Now, there are, those who, there are those who do not continue in the heritage of the servants of the Lord. There are people who are Baptists who don't continue in the heritage of the servants, servants of the Lord. There are people who think, well, getting off track just a little bit doesn't make that much difference, does it? Well, we need to know what the track is. What is the course God has laid out for us? For me, I'm continuing in the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And I ought to, I ought to be vigilant about that, guarded about that. I am free. I'm free. I'm absolutely free. I'm not all bound up about the thing. But I do owe something to a generation that came before me that paid a great price for me to have what I have. And I don't want to betray those people. And I don't want to misdirect the people coming after me. And so we'll talk more about this heritage, this treasured heritage, this truth heritage, this biblical heritage, biblical Christianity. And may God guide us. I thought I'd share with you an open letter I give to our church members because you may take everything off of it that it has any indication that it's for Temple Baptist Church in Powell, Tennessee. And if you like it, use it in your church. As a matter of fact, that goes for everything else in the notes that I give you. If you'd like to use them, use them. Uh, speaking the truth in love. I've taken this as a motto for our church. Speaking the truth in love. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. May God help us to be fellow helpers to the truth. There's so many verses God gives us about truth that I'll bring to your attention in these days. But the Temple Baptist Church, and that is always followed by speaking the truth in love. Not just speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love. Remember the Lord Jesus was full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. And some people say, well, I, I want to be very graceful about all things, and I just want to love everybody. Wonderful, but make sure you've got the truth with it. Someone said, well, I'll tell you the truth. It doesn't make any difference how I say it. It does make a difference how you say it. It ought to be said in the spirit of Jesus Christ. So speaking the truth in love. Now, I've written some things here I hope that will help you. To our members, I say you're a vital part of a church that has a vision for the world and a desire to provide a church home for every family. Now, there we're connecting our Jerusalem with the uttermost parts of the earth. Most of the time, we get so involved in our Jerusalem to the neglect of the uttermost parts of the earth. At other times, we get so involved in the uttermost parts of the earth that we neglect our Jerusalem. But in God's design, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, it all ought to be done together. And may God guide us that way. So that's why it's written in that little sentence just the way it's written. Uh, let us be committed to pray for each other. Church membership means opportunity and responsibility. What would you say church membership means? I say it means opportunity and responsibility. I hope you will not only enjoy knowing about the ministries of your church, but you will become wholeheartedly involved. God has gifted the local assembly with what is necessary to instruct and encourage Christ-likeness in all believers. The Lord has given all of His children a place of service. Our homes and our workplaces provide for us this God-given opportunity to serve as Christians in a Christ-like manner. Every day and in every place in which we live, each believer is to be wholeheartedly engaged in the ministry of the Lord. 
Think of the impact we can have on our community for Christ if we gather the Christian influence of our church in this way. In other words, we're not confining what we do to Sunday. It's unleashing the body of Christ in the work of the community and worldwide evangelism. All believers are to be engaged in the work of the ministry, speaking the truth in love. Our ministry is not to be limited to a day of the week or a certain location any more than our worship is to be limited to the days we attend church or our witnessing limited to a time of organized visitation. To restrict the ministry of the Lord in such a way is to restrict the Christian life. Our involvement in serving the Lord ought to come from our gratitude for all the Lord has done and continues to do for us. Our ministry to the Lord comes from the heart. It is not created or sustained by external pressure. It is a willing service that brings a deep joy and great satisfaction. As the church functions together as a body of believers, the body is strengthened and grows in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we organize ministry opportunities and train people for more effective service, we do it to extend the Lord's work. Specific ministries allow us to care for people, to give attention to areas of the Lord's work that tend to be neglected or that need special emphasis and provide a measure of personal accountability. Although there is but one goal in ministry, the glory of the Lord, there are many places of service. What are you willing to do in your ministry to the Lord? Devotedly yours, Clarence Sexton, pastor of the Temple Baptist Church. So I think it's good to be able to get in the hands of your people a, a letter, a statement about what you're all about. And the whole idea here basically boils down to two things that we're reaching people with the gospel and teaching people the word of God. Reaching and teaching, reaching and teaching. I'd like for you to remember those two words if you'll write them down there in the place provided, reaching and teaching. And you should be able to put everything you do under one of those things, reaching or teaching, reaching and teaching. We believe in the working church, and we'll talk about that. And the working church is a church that worships, and out of that worship works 168 hours in the week. We meet to worship God, and out of that worship and adoration of the Lord, we serve the Lord. Even in our church services, we should reflect that attitude because even in the hymn singing, we should sing songs about the greatness of God so that then we can sing songs about serving our great God. I wouldn't begin a service with, we'll work till Jesus comes. I want to sing a song about how great God is, and then we'll sing a song about, we'll work till Jesus comes. So the whole thing is reflected in, in the way we worship, and this regulative worship we'll talk more about. The lectures we'll give from this first notebook are given here. The schedule is given, these signature things. And then we begin, and I'm praying all the time about where would we begin? Before we get into the first lecture, I gave you some scripture memorization and meditation. I won't go through all of these, but I want you to notice on page 8 that there are verses that have to do with one another. Members one of another, ministers the same one to another, serving one another, bearing one another's burdens, forgiving one another, admonishing one another, taught of God to love one another, considering one another, speaking not evil of one another, using hospitality one to another, edifying one another, forbearing one another, the same mind one toward another, preferring one another, exhorting one another. And you may give these verses in your bulletin or something and emphasize one a week until you go through all of them. And or maybe keep them a little longer than that so that people understand the responsibility we have to the Lord and to one another as believers. Now the very first lecture I want to give is on speaking the truth in love. And if you have your Bible, you'll open your Bible to the book of Ephesians. Now, Paul's ministry is characterized by this expression, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. And as we look at the beginning of the church at Ephesus, we uncover some amazing secrets of the New Testament church. And I want you to make notes of these secrets. Now, here's what we're after. If we can find a Bible pattern for things, then that Bible pattern will serve as a pattern for all we do. Back to the Scripture. I'm going to repeat to you many times. We need a revolution 
back to the Bible. A revolution back to the Bible. You're standing on Bible ground. You're practicing biblical Christianity. People say, well, what are you? Well, we're people who believe in biblical Christianity. There are many deviant things going on in the name of Christianity today, but we go back to the Bible. And as much as possible, when we're expressing doctrine, we use Bible language. And so we take this example of the New Testament church that was started in Ephesus, and we follow that church plant and planning of that church from the book of Acts and from what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and we understand certain things. In the 19th chapter of Acts, the Bible records Paul's ministry as he entered the city of Ephesus. In verse 8, the Bible says, He went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So he enters this great city. And it was a great city. And he goes to the synagogues. He finds the synagogue. And there were Jews in Ephesus. Ephesus was a seacoast city, a great commercial city, a city with one of the wonders of the world, the temple of the goddess Diana. And that particular temple, we're told by historians, took 200 years, two centuries to build. The people were very proud of that. It was the thing that was most notable concerning their city. Now Paul goes in with the gospel. What power does the gospel have? What power does the gospel have? And he begins with people who have a background in Judaism. And we understand, of course, that what is found in seed form in the Old Testament is in fully developed form in the New Testament. Now, they didn't have the completed written revelation of the New Testament in Paul's day of preaching. And so we'll talk about the New Testament preacher as we move along and what he proclaimed and how he showed them reasoning from Scripture concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is. Very challenging to us. He spent three months there. Ephesus was a city filled with people who were superstitious. They were very religious, but false religion and idols prevailed. It was a city filled with sorcery and demonic activity a city that greatly resisted the truth of the gospel. It was the gateway to Asia Minor. Now, when I read something like that or share it with you, I'm thinking, did Paul have a strategy? We're going to talk about world evangelism when we conclude with our week here. And I remember going in to speak to Dr. Peter Masters about my burden in England. And I came in as the typical American into his uh, study after one of the church services years and years ago. And uh, I had gotten acquainted with him, and I said, Dr. Masters, pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, of course, Spurgeon's Church, and I said, uh, I have a burden for this country. And he was very bold about the thing, coming back at me. He came back with this expression. He said, well, don't bring me another American strategy. Now think of that. Don't bring me another American strategy strategy. If we have anything less than the power of God's Holy Spirit, we will never get it done. That was a sobering thought. On my first visit there, I said to them, is there anything here? I've been a student of Charles Spurgeon for 40 years nearly. And I said, uh, it wasn't quite 40 years back then. I said, and I, uh, since I was just a kid about 19 years old, is there anything here that was here when Spurgeon was here? I said, well, the portico. I said, uh, I know the building was bombed and burned, and can you show me anything else, you know? No. And so I, I persisted. I said, is there anything that was here when Spurgeon was here that's still the same today? And they looked at me very sternly and said, our doctrine. That was a great lesson to learn, a great lesson. What is your doctrine? What do you know about doctrine, our belief in teaching? Now, three months turns into two years in a rented hall, Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of Tyrannius. And this continued by the space of two years 
so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Notice, it's time for a separation. C.I. Schofield said, God does not use anyone until he or she has gone through a great separating experience. Now, Mr. Schofield didn't write the Bible. He did give us these notes. Maybe you like them, maybe you don't. But I think that his point is well taken. There must be a great separating experience. And if you look at your life, you're going to see it marked with separating experiences. Like Paul wrote to Rome, separated under the gospel. Notice in this passage in Acts 19, verses 9 and 10, he separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannius. So there came a time to leave the synagogues and to take those who, who had believed. That was not an easy thing to do. And in church planting, in church planting, you're going back and forth with the Word of God, working, co-laboring with the Lord and the Holy Spirit of God. And there comes a time when these people who separate themselves to the Lord separate themselves together with others who have separated themselves to the Lord. God is doing a great work here. Two years. Paul spent three months in the synagogue and the opposition became so intense that there he took the disciples that had been made during those three months and rented a hall, the hall of Tyrannus. He stayed there for two years. But we learned that he not only was meeting in that hall, they were launching out from there, preaching the gospel, seeing souls saved, establishing churches in regions round about. So there's a pattern established here. A lot of men will go into church planting work and they want to start the church too early or they'll go into a pastorate and they want to start something so early. I remember saying to our people here at the Temple Baptist Church, God's put in my heart a desire to start a college. And if you're going to vote to call me as a pastor, I want you to also vote at the same time to establish a college to train people for the Lord's service. Now, in 1978, God put in my heart a desire to have a school to train people to serve the Lord. It was very clear. God let me know that's what He wanted me to do with my life. As a matter of fact, that became, that became such a priority in my life, I knew that I was not just pastoring. Pastoring the church was to provide a pattern for people we would train. That's why I thought it could be done in the New York City area. And I was there a little over eight years thinking this has got to be the place. And uh, that dream almost died because I couldn't get it done there. I was teaching at the New York School of the Bible on Monday nights on 57th Street in Manhattan. And hundreds of people were coming along with other people who were teaching in that school on 57th at Calvary Baptist. And, uh, but it just didn't, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. This church had contacted me three years previously and I said, no, I'm married to this thing here and I'm, I'm here. I mean, God doesn't want me somewhere else. This is where I'm supposed to be. And they contacted me again and, and uh, I, I said, well, I will pray. I wound up in a hospital, unable to walk. I didn't understand what was going on. Now I do. I've had five spine surgeries since then. And the Lord worked me over in a special way. I believe God gave me those things to deal with. And there are lots of things with which he gives us, you know, gifts to deal with. But I, I came here after the church voted. They voted to call me as a pastor. And they voted to establish a college with the vote to call me as a pastor. And then I thought, I'm not going to start the college immediately. Because there's some things that need to be done in the hearts and minds of some people here so that they understand what we're about, what we're trying to do. If I jumped right into the thing, I don't think I'd ever gotten it done. Even though there was a, a seeming hearty idea about doing it, some things had to be purged in my own life and the lives of some other people. I'm saying there's a Bible pattern here and waiting on God, trying to understand as the Lord, we're not just working, the Lord is working in us and the lives of the people to bring something to pass. And so three months, he separates, and uh, they rent a hall, two years, they're out preaching. He spends more time actually than that. 
And now there's a great uproar. You, you think it's going to be smooth sailing, but no, everything but. Notice when you come to the 18th and 19th and 20th verses in Acts chapter 19, the Bible says, Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. Found it 50,000 pieces of silver. That's how much all that was worth. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now what do you think happens when the Lord is doing such a mighty thing? It stirs up the devil. It stirs up the devil in people and it stirs up the devil. Such an impact was made that they had a great gathering and people brought all kinds of things to be burned. The Bible mentions books, but no doubt there were different fetishes and idols that were brought also. They piled these things together in the city of Ephesus and burned them. This caused such an uproar that a silversmith who made little idols of the goddess Diana began to say to other silversmiths, this man is causing us such a disturbance, we're losing money, and it comes down to loss of money, doesn't it? And the temple of Diana is being profaned by this preaching of the gospel. And that temple is not only a place of worship, also a place of merchandising and business. There's a marketing center in Ephesus. And so now the whole city is in an uproar. But God does an amazing thing and delivers his preacher. This is the power of the gospel. You see, we don't expect much from the gospel, but God does. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is your expectation of the gospel? The gospel suffers from the low expectation of people who say they believe it. What's your expectation of the gospel? We say the gospel changed our lives. Has it changed our lives? It's an ongoing change too, isn't it? We've been saved from the penalty of our sin. We're being saved from the power of sin. We'll be saved from the presence of sin. We've been justified. God looks at us as, as he looks at his own dear son because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ on our account. God sees us as he sees his son, the Lord Jesus, robed in his righteousness, not as if we had never sinned, but as if we were never sinners. What a grand thing that is. Then sanctification, perfect in the eye of God, progressive in our lives. Someday we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. And then glorification. That's all a part of the work of the gospel. And Paul traveled preaching that gospel message and witnessing the power of the gospel. What great expectation. We learn so much about the first century church in the book of Ephesus, Ephesians. Now this book is one of the apostles' prison epistles. This epistle was the first to come forth from his imprisonment. Many call it the jewel of Pauline epistles. Now let me read from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. I want you to follow carefully because I had to choose a place to start. And I, I want us to begin here. The Bible says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love. Would you mark that? Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now I'm going to go into detail with this and I want you to, I want you to get it. God has used this as a transforming passage of Scripture in my life. God has used this to help me define what I am to do as a pastor and what we are to do as a church. 
And the onlooker should say, these people are speaking the truth to us and they're doing it in love. I don't want to be a half-baked Christian. I want to be thorough. I want God to deal thoroughly with me. I want to be raw on one side and burn on the other. And this is a passage that God will use in your life, in my life. This beautiful passage of Scripture has to do with the church. The Bible speaks of the church as being Christ's body. Every part of the body is to function together. If the Lord Jesus Christ came and walked on this earth as He once did in bodily form, how would He do it? He's left no room for doubt. He does this through every local assembly of baptized believers who have voluntarily joined themselves together to carry out the Great Commission. And there you have a definition for a church. You ought to be able to quote that, as we say, blindfolded, just quote it. A group of baptized believers who have voluntarily joined themselves together to carry out the Great Commission. A local assembly. This is the body of Christ on the earth. Look at it this way, if you would, please. He was once on this earth in a body. In that body, He went to the cross and bled and died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. I say this so often, I think our church could say it back to me. He became a man without ceasing to be God. We believe that Jesus Christ is co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Now, that deals with who He is. It deals with the Godhead. It deals with the idea that the Son of God is the eternal Son of God. That God became a man. He was not created. God became a man without ceasing to be God. And when He became a man, He was robed in flesh, incarnate. That's what the Latin word means, incarnate robed in flesh so they could go to the cross in that body and bleed and die for us. And there he became sin for us. The Bible says, he who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I want you as a minister to teach other people how to articulate the truth concerning Christ and the cross and his death and his burial and his bodily resurrection. Why do you believe in his bodily resurrection? And Do you believe in his bodily resurrection? He was on the earth in a body. He spent 40 days with his disciples, giving them infallible proof of his resurrection, and then ascended to heaven where he ever liveth at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. The Spirit of God has come into this world and dwell believers forever. Is there a body on this earth today? Yes, Christ in his body in the assembly of believers. It's His body, the Bible says, on earth. So what is the function of that local assembly or that body? It's the function He had to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, you say that's an oversimplification. I'm sorry if it is. But I'm trying to help people to understand what we're here for. God guide us and help us. So, as a matter of fact, each New Testament church is His body on this earth. The Bible says in the very words of Scripture, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, I want you to write on the blank page on the left-hand side there, what is the measure of a church? And the answer to the question is, the church can only be measured in its likeness to Jesus Christ. What is the measure of the church? Now, we aren't just to say that. We're to teach that so that our people repeat it. Our people are out telling people, what's the measure of our church? Well, look, I, I tell you what, you've got to have a church that can put on a great dramatic performance. You've got to have a church that can have this fabulous full choir. You've got to have a church that can have this amazing light show. Or you've got to have a church that can... No, 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 no. No, 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 no. A thousand times No. The megachurch movement is a hindrance to real biblical church growth. I hope you learn that. I believe that very strongly. It is the primitive New Testament church that we need to find. What can every church do in the preaching and teaching of God's Word, singing truth? And by the way, hymn singing and songs sung in a church should be held to the same standard 
that the preaching is held to? Why should the singing be held to a lesser standard than the preaching when it comes to truth and speaking the truth? We are to be admonishing in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. We're worshiping in these songs, but we're also teaching and admonishing in these songs. We want to be teaching truth. If you give a pass to a psalm because it moves you emotionally, but it doesn't speak the truth, then why don't you just give a pass to any kind of preaching going on that doesn't speak the truth? It's not enough for you to believe this. You're there to help the assembly that you're leading come to that conviction. And may God guide us and help us in this way. So the measure of any church. Now, this means... The sort of church it is is more important than the size church it is. When we meet the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, our work is going to be measured out and searched and revealed as to what sort, S-O-R-T, what sort it is, not what size it is. No two people have the same opportunity. No two people have the same ability. But God will hold us accountable for our opportunity and our ability. Then he says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine but by the, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. How are we going to grow? Into him. We grow into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Growing in him. Notice the words here. Henceforth no more children. The charismatic movement has done such damage to Christians around the world. But why? 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 Why has it done such damage? Because, for the most part, it's disregard of the sole authority of Scripture for our faith and practice. Once what somebody has experienced becomes as valid as the Word of God, then whose experience are people going to follow? And you see, all this emotional, glamorized thing that's going on in many of our so-called our churches that is performance oriented, that appeals to the flesh, that goes straight to the emotion, that bypasses truth, is going to create a train wreck in Christian lives. Well, you say, I'm not into all this boring, dull stuff. Well, who said being filled with God's Spirit is boring and dull? Who said truth is dull? Now, you may be dull, But I haven't met a spirit-filled person that's dull. You bring a comedian in or a performance group in and after a while you can get tired of it. But you bring somebody in, line upon line, precept upon precept, preaching and teaching the Word of God in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit and you can stay there and stay there and stay there and say, give me more, give me more, give me more. Don't allow your church to grow weary and tired boring them to death and, and some you can have a flesh fit just trying to say you're teaching the Bible. It's incumbent upon us that we seek God and work and labor in the power of God's Holy Spirit that we sing with, with dynamic in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Don't get up there and just go through the motions singing hymns like some pump hammer of a machine or something. You don't need to do that. I say to David, David pour your heart into it. Sing it joyfully. Put enthusiasm in it. We're singing about Jesus. Get excited about it. Speaking the truth in love. We need a revolution back to the Bible. Oh, and we've got people going in every direction. And it's, for the most part, our fault. The Bible says when we come to the place where we have this unity of the faith... To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, we will no more be childish, no longer act childishly. 
And we are to have childlike faith, but we are not to be childish. You ought to underline that. We're not going to be blown around by the wind. We're going to be steadfast. Do you want a steadfast church? Notice the process here we go through. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul wrestling and travailing with things concerning the believers in Galatia. He wrote in Galatians chapter 4 verse 19, My little children of whom I travail in birth again. I want you to mark that expression, travail in birth again. Travail has to do with birth. He said, I'm travailing in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Until Christ be formed in you. This is what you're after as a pastor leading that flock. You're helping people to confront the Lord. Look, please, look, please. You don't stand before the people. Look, it's me and you. You do what I say. No, 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 no. Don't become a challenge to the people. It's not you against the people. All of us, all of us, pastor and people included, all of us are here to follow the Lord Jesus. I want to lead the way to Him, but we're all following the Lord Jesus and growing in Him and growing up in Him. Christ formed in you and Christ formed in me as we die to self. By the way, you don't need to run off somewhere for the latest new idea to try to implement it in your church. Uh, meetings even like this one I'm conducting would be unnecessary if we have real revival sweep through. We'll find our sufficiency in God and His Word. So the only prompting we really need is to seek the Lord and seek His Word. God guiding us. I travail first to see you born again and to get the gospel to you. Now he says, I'm travailing again that you be delivered from this outward religion. I'm travailing until Christ be formed in you. Paul warned Timothy when he wrote him in 2 Timothy about a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. I said the other evening when I was preaching to a group of people in a fellowship meeting in South Carolina, we ought to just offer a course, it looks like, and how to have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Let's just offer a course in it and see how much hip we can get, you know, how hip we can be, what all we can do, and how big a church we can build without God, what men can produce and have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof because that's basically what we're doing. And the first place we need to take the ax is not to someone else but to our own selfish, foolish desires, mine included. Why, this flesh wants to be seen. It wants to be heard. It wants to be noticed. It wants to be called upon. It wants to be followed. It may have to be suppressed, but that's all right. But it doesn't want to die. And God teaches us that we should die to self and the living Christ be seen in us. Paul spoke about the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4. He said the same thing he mentioned in Galatians chapter 4. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now I want you to circle the little expression in the second paragraph there until Christ be formed in you on page 16 and circle the expression the fullness of Christ in the third paragraph and connect the two, would you please? See, we talk about the human penman, but the Bible has the same author, doesn't it, for every book. I often hear pastors say when they have taken a new church, I'm going to preach to the people about being unified in the Lord. I'm going to try to bring everybody together I want to help everybody to get along. Well, I want you to know it doesn't work that way. I know they have good intentions, but we are not going to find the unity we desire simply because some preachers think that we should have it. There must be a meeting place. Where is the meeting place? The common ground. This common ground is in the person of Jesus Christ. As I wrote to you a little earlier, our mutual love for the Lord Jesus brings us together. Our mutual love for the Lord Jesus. 
For example, if you love the Lord Jesus and follow Him, and I love the Lord Jesus and follow Him, then we're going to get along and be in the unity of the faith. And so we try to reason with people about this and say, well, you know, uh, you don't like that kind of piano? Well, I do like that kind of piano. Can't we agree on a certain kind of piano? Or you don't like that kind of music? And I like that kind of music. You don't like that kind of color? And I like that kind of color. You don't like that kind of carpet? And I like that kind of carpet. Wait a minute. What are we trying to get people together on? Tell me about when you came to know the Lord as your Savior. What He means to you. And I want to talk to you about what the Lord's done for me and how I came to know Him. Find the common ground in Christ. Just as you would do that with an individual, do that with a church. And you're making a grave mistake. After 47 years in the ministry and pastoring churches, I, I tell you this and I say this because I've made it so many times. Don't just hammer people and hammer people and hammer people at what they ought to do. Don't do that. Let's talk about what Christ has given us to do and whether or not we love Him and want to obey Him and delight in obeying Him. And all of us agree that He's our Savior and we love Him and we want to obey Him. God help us. God help us. If people do not love the Lord and desire to follow the Lord, if they do not love Him, there can be no unity in the faith. Unity is not the goal. It is the byproduct of giving ourselves as completely as possible to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you keep scratching around, let's get together, church. Let's all get together. Let's all love one another. That's a byproduct of our mutual love for the Lord Jesus. Don't make it a goal when it's a byproduct. Make a goal out of a byproduct. You weaken the goal. The same thing is true in marriage. By the way, won't you write that down? If you make a goal out of a byproduct, you're going to weaken the goal. When you make the task the goal and not Christ the goal, you weaken the goal. And many of us make the task the goal and not the one who gave us the task the goal. I know this because I failed so often in that very thing. This is what Paul is preaching and teaching. We find our unity in the person of Jesus Christ. If we have some difference with someone, think first about what you can have in common with Him in Christ. Is Christ your Savior? Then we deal with the unity of the faith. Oh, praise God. Talk about the new birth. Talk about the person of Christ. Now notice what the Lord says. We're together on page 18. He gave some apostles... In order to accomplish God's goal in the local assembly, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.11 that He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. As far as being someone who's an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus, we can't have that apostolic succession today, but the, the word means a sent one, and there are sent ones. The Holy Spirit has sent them. Do you sense in your heart that God has given you your assignment? You're following Him? Gave some prophets. A prophet in the biblical sense of the prophet was one who foretold things before they happened. Because we have a completed written revelation of God's word, then we're not going to have foretellers. We're going to have forth tellers proclaiming the gospel and proclaiming the word of God. Where people don't have a Bible basis like this, go to the places where charismatics have taken over. Lots of countries where there's been a strong Catholic base and now have been invaded with, with the charismatic movement, you'll find people who want you to prophesy. They want you to foretell things. And you've got to straighten that out. And by the way, you can't straighten everyone out, but you'll find some people who want the truth. And when you speak the truth in love, get that group together and build with that. He gave some evangelists. Some evangelists, these are people who go with the gospel message into areas where Christ is not known. We would associate this with the missionary work, taking the gospel. He gave some pastors. These are the shepherds who care for the flock, loving and leading the people as a shepherd would his sheep. And when I speak entirely on the shepherd, I say this. You can be a leader without being a shepherd, but you cannot be a shepherd without being a leader. I'd like you to write that down, would you? You can be a leader 
without being a shepherd. But you cannot be a shepherd without being a leader. In other words, if you put leadership first, you may not love the flock. You may just love yourself and want to be seen. But if you place the emphasis on the shepherd, you see, the leader can lead without being a shepherd, but the shepherd will be a leader. God help us to understand that. He'll give understanding. So we need shepherds. The sheep need shepherds. He gave some teachers. Now these are gifts he gave to the church. What do you say? Apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers. What did he say? Prophets, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now why did he do this? Why did he do this? With the top of page 20, these gifts were put into practice. And when they're put into practice, they exemplify the ministry of the Lord Jesus as an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. He was sent by the Father. He preached God's word. He was sent after the lost. He pastored his disciples, teaching them how to love and care for others. He taught the scriptures to his followers. Now, our ministry is to continue his ministry, speaking the truth in love. If you want to explain these gifts, use the paragraph at the top of page 20 to explain how all of these five gifts to the church together work to exemplify the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. And our ministry is to continue His ministry. These gifts to the church enable us to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ. Each local assembly, when functioning properly, represents well the beautiful ministry of the Lord Jesus. Our measure is in our likeness to Him. That's the only thing God looks for. Behaving like the Lord would have us behave toward people, toward one another. Notice this amazing work then that's produced by that. The Lord gave us these gifts to the church that by these He might accomplish His purpose. And the Bible says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. I want you to circle the little word for. Then for the work of the ministry. Circle a little word for. And then for the edifying of the body of Christ. I want you to circle a little word for. May I read this again? These gifts, these five gifts he gave the local assembly for the work, you see, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, let's imagine that we could see one of these growing out of the previous one. So, as the saints are perfected, what do they do? The work of the ministry. As they do the work of the ministry, what do we have? The edifying of the body of Christ. So, our work, these five gifts to the local assembly for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We must yield to Christ every area in our lives that is not what it should be. This is the perfecting of the saints. This is until Christ be formed in us. We're asking people to do something that spiritual people do, and they're not spiritual people. The Bible says, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. You're not going to have restoration if you don't have spiritual people to do that. So why do you have a shepherd? Why do you have a church? Why do you have the body of Christ? Because this world needs someone to speak the truth in love. Yes, there's a real hell, a real heaven. Yes, the homosexual agenda is an attack against God and the family structure that's the foundation of a civilized society. Yes, show them in the Bible this is the truth, but it must be spoken in love. We cannot do that if we're not full of grace and truth. We cannot do that. We cannot do that unless Christ is formed in us. We cannot do that effectively as a local assembly without that measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. We cannot. So our work, our work, is to help mature the saints so they can do the work of the ministry. 
So we can see the edifying of the body of Christ. Speaking the truth in love. And may God guide us. And you have these things given here. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Top of page 22. Why? Why? And the answer is given here. In verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ is our goal. God is our goal. B.B. Warfield, the famous Presbyterian preacher who emphasized so much the second coming of Christ, as far as I know, gave us that expression, our goal is God. You ought to write that down. And when you say it, if somebody's well read, they're going to know Warfield said that. So according to what... B.B. Warfield said, he's one of, the, one of the men you'll find in the notes of the Schofield Reference Bible, a contemporary of those men. He said, our goal is God. Our goal is God. Anything less is an unfit goal. Our goal is God. Now, wait just a minute. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to find a quick way to get it done. I'd like to have 500 by a certain date or 300 by a certain date. And I'd like to just bypass all that stuff. I'd like to have a big crowd and there's some things I want to do and I'd be looked at a certain way if I have a big crowd. And by the way, I want to reach as many people as possible with the gospel. No doubt about that. But what's, what's in that assembly? Is it a church? Is it the body of Christ? Does it behave like the Lord Jesus? Does it speak the truth in love? What gifts has God given so that it can work and function the way it ought to work and function? What are those gifts? What do they produce? What do they produce in the idea, uh, in the idea here? What is, what is it producing in your life and my life? Am I growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus? Is Christ being formed in my life? Do you, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you worship Him? Are you conscious of His presence when you come together? Is the goal of your daily life to allow God to transform you, to be living a life in obedience to Him? Are you constantly yielding to Him? Are you alive unto God as a spiritual person, having been born of God's Spirit? So why all of this? You want to find a shortcut? So let's establish schools. Schools, I mean schools. Let's establish schools that major in methodology and not theology. Our, our methods ought to be biblical, as biblical as our theology. Now means change. I, I, I don't take a horse and buggy to... To meetings to speak, I fly on an airplane. But methods ought to be biblical just as the message is biblical. And a lot of people are getting by with a lot of junk that shouldn't be getting by with it if there were discerning people watching because they've changed methods to anything but biblical. And they're bypassing what God has made and has created work when He made a spirit, soul, and body. And our spirit, we're dead in our trespasses and sins until we're born again. And you have to quicken who we're dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. In our soul, we have intellect, emotion, and will. I can overpower you emotionally through media. I can overpower you. How do you know that? I can overpower you through media. I can overpower you emotionally. You watch a scary movie on something and you might cry or get scared to leave the room. But if you were thinking six feet from where the people are on that screen, there's a TV camera and lights and all that kind of stuff, but you're caught up in the moment emotionally. And I can bypass fact, truth, and get to you emotionally. As a matter of fact, I can even create an emotional worship that is soul worship and it's not spirit worship. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 4, we're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. If you tried to meet God in the holy place, you would not have met God. 
You had to go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies to meet the Lord. If your body is like the outer court and your soul is like the holy place and your spirit where God dwells is the Holy of Holies, you, you don't meet God in the holy place. You meet God in the Holy of Holies. And we can work you up emotionally that you can have soul worship. Man, whoa, I felt good in there. Yeah. But was it truth-based? Was it about Christ? Did it travel the right line here? Intellect, emotion, and will. Are you apt to commit yourself to something that's not even truthful because you got emotionally worked up about it? Listen, we're on dangerous ground in this country because of a lack of biblical soundness. And I'm not trying to say to you that I, I've got all the answers, but the truth of the matter is these are perilous times and the most dangerous thing we deal with is the thing that's nearest the truth but is not the truth. Where are we going to go? We're to speak the truth in love. I remember taking one of our college CDs to Dr. Al Smith. I said, I want you to listen to this. I think it's great. I think it's great. First one we ever did. I took it to his home in South Carolina. I said, I want you to listen to this. And he was a discerning man. He listened to it. I was so excited. We produced a, a tape with a choir, a CD with a choir. I was so excited. And Dr. Smith said, I'm not happy about this. I said, well, I mean, he took all the air out of my sails. He said, this thing is so orchestrated, you can't hear the words. He said, the only thing you should be concerned about is, are these kids singing truthful words? I learned a great lesson from that old man. I learned a great lesson. And we need to learn great lessons like that and apply them to life. Speak the truth in love. I knew there was some problem with one of our young men when he had to stop his church service when he had a projector going on with his message with all the pictures and the projector broke and they stopped the church service and said, I can't finish the sermon until I, until I get it fixed and get all the stuff up, you know. Now that really happened. Now what kind of nonsense is that? Let me just read, let me just read this portion of Scripture. And I want you just to follow along. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 28, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. His body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach. And here are the three things we're to do. Warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. That's our assignment. We're to warn every man, to teach every man, to present every man perfect in the Lord Jesus. It's my job, Paul said, to warn every man, to teach every man, that every man may be presented perfect in Christ. This is the pastor's responsibility. Many people have no idea why they come to church meetings. Sadly, so many pastors could not explain the biblical reason for the meeting of the church. The worst thing imaginable is for them to get the idea that the meeting is an end in itself. People get the idea that they have earned merit just because they came to church. We use this expression, this is for that. This is for that. Why do we assemble together? We assemble together so that we might be perfected. Weak areas of our lives are brought to the realization of the Spirit of God as He convicts us and the light of God's Word and the light of God's Spirit shine on us and show us you're not the Christ-like person you ought to be in these areas of your life. We meet together so that we might hear how to do the work of the ministry. We come so that we might be edified and built up to be strong in the Lord, to have this unity of the faith, to go out and do God's work. Of course, 
We are to be constantly aware of those who are lost and need to hear clearly the way of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope you don't get distracted by this crowd that preaches and teaches something that is not really biblical. As I say, as for me, my conviction is, I have friends who don't believe this, dear personal friends who don't believe this, but I believe Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. And I must get the gospel to all people. Let me read what I've written here at the bottom of page 24. When we are truly following the Lord, we come with Bible in hand, with an open heart to the Lord, saying, Lord, speak to me, show me, help me, reveal to me areas in my life that need to be yielded to Thee. Enable me to do Your work each day, all during the week. Show me how to do the work of the ministry. Help me, Lord, to be built up and to be strong. I don't want to be like a child, blown away by everything that happens. I don't want Satan to have an advantage over me. I don't want to be a childish person overreacting to everything all week long. Build me up. Lord, strengthen me. Help me to know I can be strong in Thee. Help me to leave this place and go out to live the Christian life in a way that demonstrates that Christ Jesus is real, that He's alive and at work in my heart. And we leave the assembly seeking the lost as Christ seeks them through us. Is this what's happening? Is this what's happening? Well, the meeting is a gathering of many people or a handful of people when the local assembly of baptized believers who have voluntarily joined themselves together to carry out the Great Commission comes together. It's for a purpose. As a part of a local assembly, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're moving toward the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Our local church... In our local church, we have been together for many years serving God. Our precious people know that we wait on God, we pray, we seek God's way. We try not to get in a hurry. Some may say, I, I don't know if, about all these things you're attempting to do, but we still take the time to pray and wait on God and see if it's what God wants and if God's in it. We wait for the Lord to show us, to give us His direction, to move forward in the unity of the faith. And He's already at work in this world. Already he's at work in this world and we're laboring with him. We must speak the truth, the whole counsel of God, the truth in love. I want you to meditate on these things and there's some things that God no doubt has spoken to your heart about as you've listened to this. I want you to take the time with a pen in hand to write your thoughts down. Would you please? May I ask just a few questions? What is your goal What is the one thing you want for your Christian life? I say to our people, God does His greatest work for us in our hearts. Would you agree? You see, even the work can appear to grow while the worker is withering away. God does His greatest work for us in our hearts. We do our greatest work for Him in our homes. You never do a greater work for God than what you do in your home. May the Lord help us. Now, this is our starting point. When we get together again, we'll talk about our vision of God. And our vision of God determines everything else in our life. The place we give the Lord determines the place we give everything else in our lives. I'm praying for revival in my own heart. I'm asking God in wrath, remember mercy. I love being with you. I have energy God gives me because I, I have a desire to help you and I want the Lord to help me help you. But I don't want you to get the idea that I've got all the answers. I don't. I'm passionate about things. I should be after 47 years in the ministry. But I'm passionate because this is my moment, just like it's your moment. I don't want to be passive in my moment. I don't want you to be passive in your moment. We won't have our moment again. We won't. We're continuing in the heritage of the servants of the Lord. 
And our faith is a treasured heritage. May I show you something I'd like for you and you and you. One, two, three, four, five, six. To stand in a straight line right across here. Maybe about two feet in front of one another. Facing from my left to right. Now you come in front of him, please. And come in front of him, about two feet in front of him. Face the same way. Line up with him exactly. Come around the same way. 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 Line up exactly. Now, I realize that humans have error, but there's a guiding truth. It's God's Word. I believe that we can have the same biblical doctrine and the same emphasis of Scripture from generation to generation to generation. If I said to you that something was going on in America that was not true to our American heritage, let's say it was not rule of law. Rule of law is a part of our heritage, isn't it? If I said to you that uh, somebody uh, was doing something and they called it American and it was a violation of these unalienable truths, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, somebody says, no, 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 you don't have liberty anymore. We've taken your liberty. We'd say that's not a part of American heritage. We understand there's an American heritage. But there's also a Christian heritage. And we need to know what that heritage is because from one generation to the next generation to the next generation, that heritage is given from one generation to the next to the next. And the Bible guides us in that heritage. Right. Now, let's imagine someone takes it upon themselves. If you'll move two steps to your left, no one else, just you, two steps to your left, just two steps to your left. Let's imagine someone takes it upon themselves and say, I, I'm going to be an individualist. I, these, are, these are moments I've got. I, I, I've got things I want to do. Does he really owe a debt to people who have lived a biblical heritage and handed it to him? He's sinning against the past. But what about who's going to follow him? Where are they going to go? Now this may not illustrate it for you. Maybe something else will during the week. But it's not a small thing to me that someone would take a tiny turn and say, I'm going to make this a more of a man-centered thing instead of a Christ-centered. I'm going to make this more of something that is felt than it is soul scripture authority. And when that happens... There has to be a revolution back to the Bible. Now when that happens, that revolution back to the Bible, somebody says, well, he's a fanatic. He wants to keep it in. And somebody will call you a fanatic. I'm saying our faith is a treasured heritage. It's not something to be monkeyed with from one generation to the next. May God guide us. Thank you so much. And let's speak the truth and make sure we're speaking the truth in love. Thank you for listening. Let's pray, may we? Our Father, we give you praise and glory for the opportunity to be in this meeting. Help us not to be smart Alex. Help us not to be people who are just mad about everything. But help us to be filled with your spirit, to love you with all of our heart, and to take our stand accordingly. Give us a night's rest and bring us back tomorrow to begin the day with the high vision of you, Lord. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.